a couple of cases in point, and these are, this is not by any means all encompassing or the biggest cases, but I think they're good, good examples. The New York City watershed is a great example. And this was regulation driven. Uh, in 1989, the EPA passed surface water treatment regs and right away it became clear that New York City, which has an unfiltered water supply system, was going to have to build a filtration plant. Now that was going to be up to $8 billion to build this thing. That was going to be a major drain on the city. It was going to run, cost $300 million a year to run. So there were some conversations that happened and they said, why don't we take care of the watershed that feeds into the city? What could we do to clean up the water supply? And it took them five, six, seven years, a lot of negotiations. Things almost fell apart a couple times. But it actually worked. And what they've spent is $1.5 billion. Of that, they've only spent like $150 million on actual agricultural best management practices. And I think most people here would feel that best management is better than a bunch of practices that you dump and maybe they do or don't work. But that's a pretty big cost savings, 1.5 versus 8 billion with 300 million annual operating. And it's a success story today. Things are working. The water quality has improved to the point where they don't need a water treatment plant. And this was a deal between a local city and an up, a whole uh, upstream watershed. And I, I have to say, I live very close. I live across the lake from much of that watershed. And it's a very economically depressed region. And it's been a bit of an economic boon to that region. So it's been win-win in a number of ways. Now here are two small villages in northern India, Swan and Bodhi. And these villages, uh, Swan had village, uh, wells that were running dry. And this was a big issue of concern. They understood why this was happening, because up in Bodhi, there was deforestation on the hillsides. People needed fuel and building materials, and they were cutting it down. And the grazing management was pretty horrible. So the people in Swan, they, they got some help from the government, but they worked out a deal with the people in Bodhi, and they gave their labor. That's what they had, they had not much money. And they went up to Bodhi, and they replanted all the hillsides with their labor. And in, in exchange, the people in Bodhi um, worked to improve the grazing and ag management. Bodhi folks got increased fodder and fuel, and within a few years, the wells started filling up again, and the silt coming down the waterways really decreased, and the damage decreased. I think it's a good example of people working with what they had, working on a deal, and making it work. In a, in a sense, it's a very pure payment for watershed services arrangement. Now here's a business to business example in Vittel, France. I don't know how many people have drinking, drunk Perrier since there were some contaminants in about 15 years ago. But this is that mineral source, mineral water source. Uh, nitrate and pesticide contamination had gotten into the water. And the formerly pastoral landscape upstream of them had gone to corn. It was now corn. And there was a lot of erosion, a lot of pesticides, a lot of fertilizer getting into the water. And it was creeping up, and this is very closely monitored water because it's very lucrative, the, the products that they sell from it. So Nestle Waters uh, became concerned, and they tried to figure it out. It took them about a decade, but they finally worked out a deal. And it was a very lucrative deal for the upstream farmers. There was a five-year transition phase, and during that time, uh, they were getting $110 an acre for that five years, plus Nestle would give the farmer about 200 k to upgrade their equipment, new buildings, new tractors, stuff to get the job done to do their nutrient management and general management better. There was an 18 or 30 year contract. There was ongoing free labor to apply compost in the farmer's fields and free technical assistance ongoing. This was lucrative for the farmers and it was very lucrative for the company. Here was a company that needed these services, made the deal, and it's been working. Again and again, I come back to the real leadership in land management has come from the land. I think especially in the 20th century, we had 100 years worth of pioneers. People like Andre Voisin, Friend Sykes, Newman Turner, Alan Savory, P.A. Yeomans, who invented Keyline, and so many more people. So many different methodologies and approaches to improving land were developed, and I'd say it was just in time. 
just in time for us to take advantage of some big market opportunities and just in time to address these big natural resource issues we're facing and just in time to address the fact that we're not running our civilization very well if we're running out of topsoil. I count about 40 broad categories of tools, each of those often with dozens of subcategories, for ways to make land better, more productive, and to do it in a way that uh, increases biological diversity. The leadership continues to come from the producers, and I'm not going to go into a lot of examples. I want to tell one story uh, about a guy who's really influenced me named Gabe Brown. His mentor is Gene Govan. They're collectively called the Burley County Boys, and they've invented some, something called cover crop cocktailing, partly because it's so many seeds put together, partly probably because of the cocktails that were drank during the formulation of the methodology. <laughs> they're broad-scale grazers and grain farmers, and they're no-tillers. They're part of a very strong tradition of no-tilling. And on Gabe's Brown, uh, Gabe's farm, he's combining his crop off, and then he's immediately going in and drilling 10 to 20 varieties, typically mostly annuals, mixed together, right into the stubble. Here we have 65 days after seeding. You can see sunflower and sorghum and buckwheat, and he has a lot of brassicas in there, a lot of winter cereals. The diversity is incredible, and what's been happening, they've teamed up with a lot of researchers, scientists, NRCS folks, and they've got a really good team with a lot of innovation going, and they've done a lot of side-by-side -side comparisons. Even in drought periods, these cocktails next to a monocrop, say, just a triticale crop. The triticale will die, or even triticale and clover, it'll die. But when they get the 10 or 20, something happens. The diversity of exudates, the diversity in the profile of the roots, and these things just keep producing. And come September, October, November, they've got something like eight tons of dry matter standing out in these fields with incredibly diverse forage. They don't need minerals, the animals perform incredibly, in November, this grazing event right here with these animals, these young stock were gaining, I think, 3.1 pounds, uh, pounds per day in November. That's, that's pretty good gain. But it goes on because they're grazing maybe 30% of that dry matter and leaving the other 70% on the ground to feed the soil. And what Gabe's realized on this 4,000 acre farm, he's uh, had about a 12 fold increase in water infiltration half an inch an hour to six inches per hour. And a few years back, they had 13 and a half inches of rain in 22 hours, zero erosion. The next day, they were able to drive on their fields without adversely affecting soil structure. That's how good the drainage has become. They're using 10% of the fertilizer of their neighbors. They're using a quarter of the herbicide. Uh, adjusted for insurance, they're getting 117 bushel corn yield compared to 70 bushel county average. I think these are amazing numbers. He's obviously succeeding in every way. 